announcing the arrival of Professor Dr. Adiba, the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Thank you. Please be seated. Good evening, Professor Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, the Dean Faculty of Medicine, Professor Dr. Sanjeev Mahadewa, Management of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, and His Excellencies, Tan Sri Tan Sri, Dato Dato, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Welcome to the inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Sanjeev Mahadewa entitled Epidemiology and Impact of Gastrointestinal Symptoms, an Asian Perspective. Without further delay, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Adiba Kamaru Zaman to chair the lecture and introduce Professor Dr. Sanjeev Mahadeva. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Deputy Deans, colleagues uh, from the faculty, and of course, uh, Professor Sanjeev Mahadeva, who's uh, taken up the challenge to give his inaugural speech today. We've seen um, a whole series of uh, inaugural speeches being given in the last uh, few months by senior members of the faculty, so that's really encouraging. Um, my task is to introduce uh, Sanjeev, who is not only a senior member of the Department of Medicine of the faculty, but also um, a colleague um, in, in, the, in the department. Sanjeev is a consultant gastroenterologist and professor at the F Faculty of Medicine. 
He qualified with a basic medical degree from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in 1993. I didn't realize he was that young. <laughs> I just realized uh, this when I saw this last night. And subsequently pursued his postgraduate training in internal medicine, ob obtaining the MRCP UK in 1997. Following this, he underwent subspecialty training in gastroenterology, hepatology, and therapeutic endoscopy in Yorkshire in the UK, culmin culminating in the award of Certificate of Completion of Specialist Training, or CCST, in the UK in 2003. He's one of those who loves the country and returned to Malaysia in 2004 and joined the gastroenterology unit at University of Malaya. Medical Center, where he has remained and actively contributed to cl clinical service, undergraduate and postgraduate training, as well as research. While working at the UMMC, he decided to pursue a higher research degree with academic work that was conducted locally. So in, in 2009, he was awarded an MD from the University of Leeds for his research work on the epidemiology and clinical aspects of dyspepsia in Malaysia, which you will hear about in a short while. To date, Professor Sanjeev has published over 70 full papers in peer-reviewed international journals and has over 60 presentations at national and international academic conferences. He's a reviewer for several international journals and sits on the editorial board of both the Asia-Pacific and American journals in gastroenterology. Outside of UM, he has also contributed actively to national societies in medicine. He's a past president of the Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition Society of Malaysia and is the current president of the Malaysian Society of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. So that's a written text. At a personal level, I've known Sanjeev since he returned to uh, Malaysia in 2004, uh, where I was already uh, a lecturer, or, or probably an AP at that stage, and in the Department of Medicine. I've always found Sanjeev to be someone who's very passionate uh, about the excellence in care and, and teaching and uh, only recently stepped down as the coordinator for the postgraduate training program for internal medicine, although he remains very involved in um, ensuring uh, that we continue to provide good training uh, to, to our students, particularly the postgraduate students. I also know Sanjeev as someone who's very passionate about social justice and health equity. Um, if he wasn't passionate about social justice, I don't think he will be with us here today. Um, as a gastroenterologist and hepatologist who could potentially earn um, much, much more in private practice. I just want to quote a colleague of mine um, when I was in, in Australia who's a, who's a gastroenterologist just like Sanjeev who spends his morning and night uh, doing colonoscopy and endoscopy and said to me, you know, Adiba, if uh, if there is a gastroenterologist, this is, this is in the context of Australia, in the context of Melbourne. If, if there's a gastroenterologist who doesn't earn half a million dollars a month, then he's bone lazy. So um, I don't think Sanjeev is, remains here at, at, at the Faculty of Medicine University of Malaya because he's bone lazy and doesn't want to earn half a million, well, in, in the Malaysian context, maybe not that much, but uh, certainly a handsome sum. But uh, I do think that he's remained here because uh, he truly believes that uh, he can contribute to the um, to the next generate to the production of the next gen generation of uh, doctors and and specialists, particularly in his field. So, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we'll hear about his work in dyspepsia in Malaysia, which is a very very common problem, and uh, through his clinical care and research, Sanjeev has contributed immensely in this field. Sanjeev. Thank you, uh, Professor Adiba, for that very kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, uh, in particular, uh, some people who've been uh, very important to me in my uh, career in the University of Malaya, uh, uh, Dr. Professor K. L. Go, my senior and boss uh, at the Unit of Gastroenterology. Uh, Professor Hematram Yadav, who's come all the way from uh, International Medical University today. 
and respected uh, friends and colleagues uh, from the Faculty of Medicine. In uh, behavioral science, uh, it is well known that you end up pursuing a career uh, based on the influence of very prominent people in your life. And it's because of these influences, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am what you call a clinician, a clinician, but with someone with an interest in research. I've trained for most of my career in clinical medicine, initially in internal medicine, and then in gastroenterology. And I dare say that I did not have much in the way of academic uh, research uh, in the earlier parts of my career. But somehow along the way, um, fate, if you call it that, uh, has put me in touch with certain prominent individuals who've had a strong sway in the way I've turned out today. Allow me to uh, introduce some of them to you. The first person is this man called Mervyn Davis. Dr. Mervyn Davis is a consultant hepatologist from St. James's University Hospital in Leeds. I owe much of my introduction and training to gastroenterology to this man uh, because I was actually a SHO, or uh, you call it your medical officer, in training with him. And it was because he was impressed by my ability that he fully supported my entry into the British training program for gastroenterology. Uh, Mervyn Davis was one of those uh, very, very inspirational characters, not in terms of what he said, but what, what he did. This is uh, a man solely developed the Leeds liver transplant service from almost nothing to becoming the fifth largest transplant service in the world over a period of about nine to 10 years. And he did that by sheer hard work. Uh, Dr. Davis would be at work every day at 5.30 in the a.m. Now, that may not be uncommon for some doctors in Malaysia, but what is uncommon is that his house was 13 kilometers from the hospital, and he used to cycle every day. So I don't know what time he left his house, uh, but this man cycled to work every day and was there at 5.30 in the morning, not to see patients, but mainly uh, to uh, go through the administrative work. And uh, for those of you who have trained in the British healthcare system, you know that there's an enormous amount of ad, uh, admin work that all clinicians have to do. And he used to come in at 5.30 in the morning. And not only was he a busy clinician, uh, he also did some research, not a lot, uh, but enough to earn him about 50, 60 publications in his, in his career. But what impressed me most was this phenomenal character and giant of a clinician always had time for teaching, always had time for his juniors, uh, and always had time for their careers. And that left a, a fairly indomitable impression in my mind. My next uh, impression came from two clinicians who I worked with uh, when I was a registrar in this place called Scarborough. Now, I know many of you have not been, but Scarborough General Hospital is a tiny, tiny, small district hospital in the north of England. Uh, if you want to equate it, probably something smaller than the Lord Intan Hospital. But there were these two eminent uh, clinicians, one called Charles Mitchell, who was my boss, and he was a consultant gastroenterologist, and the other, John McPhee, and both John McPhee and Charles Mitchell formed what is no, now known as the Combined Gastroenterology Unit. They were working in a small district hospital, and with that, that meant no funding for research from uh, any university grants or major grants. But what these two individuals who had a passion for research did was they used to have a combined private clinic once a week. Uh, in the private wing uh, near the government hospital. And they donated all the earnings from that private clinic to research. And that is how they funded their research, which, as you can see here, 
from their website. They can even boast a list of publications. John McPhee uh, was the brains, really, but uh, Charles Mitchell was an active contributor. And John McPhee actually earned himself a Hunterian professor of surgery uh, based on research from this Scarborough General Hospital. The Hunterian professor is awarded by the Royal College of Surgeons. So that's the equivalent of, say, the head of surgery in Tolo Intan Hospital uh, doing so much research that the Royal College awards you a uh, uh, professorship. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this certainly left a huge, huge impression on my mind. The third person uh, whom I also had the uh, privilege of training with was this man, uh, Professor Anthony Exxon, who is no stranger to many Malaysian gastroenterologists. Uh, Professor Exxon was also a very dedicated clinician. In fact, he had the busiest and the most successful private practice in Leeds uh, at that time. As a gastroenterologist, he had a huge manor house uh, outside of Leeds, and it took you about 20 minutes to drive from the gate entrance to his main house. So that successful he was. But this uh, clinician also had that much of an interest in research that he had published more than 300 papers uh, uh, in, in gastroenterology, earning him many uh, positions in esteemed societies, uh, president of the British Society of Gastroenterology, uh, editor of many uh, academic journals as well. He has been to Malaysia many times. And again, what impressed me about this giant uh, in clinical and academic gastroenterology was that no matter where he went, he always had time to come for our CME meetings, which were held once a week for trainees, and always had time when you had uh, some stupid research project that you thought would, uh, would be Nobel Prize winning. So this man always uh, 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 left that impression in me. The last person, of course, is no stranger to all of you, uh, none other than our own Professor uh, Go Kian Lee who has been the head of the gastroenterology unit uh, and the person I worked for and with uh, in the, uh, with my time in University of Malaya. Professor Goh, as you can see, is also a very busy clinician, so busy that when they took this picture for the Medeca Award, he still had his endoscopy uh, uh, shirt on. He had no time to take off. I think between the pictures, he was scoping about 10 or 11 different patients at the same time. But no matter how busy he is, what impressed me more about uh, Professor Goh is uh, his commitment and time that he has had for research. And certainly with an impressive record of more than 200 uh, publications as well, and again on the seat of numerous uh, esteemed societies, it is this combination of uh, clinical medicine and uh, clinical research that has uh, left an impression on me. So with that, we come to the uh, uh, main focus of my presentation today, and that is on uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, gastrointestinal symptoms of the chronic nature tends to be divided into either that originating from the upper GI tract, uh, known as upper GI symptoms, and that from the lower GI tract, known as uh, lower GI symptoms. In most of these Pa patients with chronic disease, functional GI diseases are the commonest cause. And amongst the commonest causes of upper GI symptoms, dyspepsia predominates. And for lower GI symptoms, uh, it is IBS or irritable bowel syndrome that uh, is, is the commonest cause. Amongst these two, dyspepsia is by far most common, especially in the Asia Pacific region. And it is this condition that I've decided to choose uh, my focus on for today. What is dyspepsia? Dyspepsia basically is a collection of symptoms referable to the upper gastrointestinal tract. And I've listed out here a whole lot of symptoms which any patient with dyspepsia can complain of. Essentially, dyspepsia causes can be divided broadly into either an organic cause, such as peptic ulcers, uh, reflux esophagitis, and even cancer, particularly in the older patients. But largely, 
it is caused by something known as functional dyspepsia, which is uh, basically patients who have dyspepsia symptoms but do not have a structural cause for their symptoms. So my interest really was by accident, by default, because as you heard before, I trained in the UK, and after that I came to work in uh, uh, the University of Malaya Medical C Center, and it just so happened that I, I, I it just so happened that I had to happen to work in two units with a similar interest, mainly in upper GI diseases. So it was an ex-colleague of mine, a senior uh, colleague of mine, uh, Professor Paul Moedi, who has since then moved on from Leeds to uh, McMaster's uh, University and become the head of gastroenterology there, and who is now also the editor of the American Journal of Gastroenterology. At that time, he was still in Leeds, and he knew that I was coming out to Malaysia, and he said, why not look at differences in dyspepsia? Um, because both units had a similar research interest. Now, Paul being Paul, uh, he knew that there was going to be some differences because there were other differences between Asians and Westerners that would influence uh, dyspepsia. First of all, we know very well that our diet is different. Upper GI symptoms are largely uh, associated with food and uh, Although the diet in the West is slowly changing, but largely the fish and chips is your standard plate. And uh, rice-based or noodle-based food tends to be our standard platter. So with that, that is possibly one reason why differences in symptoms should occur. Secondly, there is this bacteria, which all of you have heard of, uh, known as Helicobacter pylori. Now, uh, significant differences have been documented to occur between the European uh, st strains compared to the Asian strains. And we know, as you know, H. pylori is strongly associated with uh, ulcers and cancers in the stomach. So differences in strain might be uh, related to differences in dyspepsia symptoms. Largely, uh, there is still a difference in body habitus between the Matsale and the Asian man. Uh, although the Asian man tends to grow sideways now a little bit, uh, we still have difficulty in trying to catch up with height. And body mass index has been shown to be strongly associated with upper GI symptoms. So with all these east versus west differences, it was apt that we studied dyspepsia. So somewhere around uh, 2004, I think, 2004, we did a cross-sectional study. Uh, I had just come back uh, to Malaysia at that time, and there was some ready-made data from the UK, and we used very similar methods, uh, very similar type of uh, patients, and we were able to compare about 600 British patients and about 1,000 uh, Malaysian patients. And true enough, we did find differences uh, in dyspepsia between British and Malaysian patients. There were differences in symptoms, um, and differences in organic pathology as per our hypothesis. And this difference was published in uh, a tier one journal back in 2005, my cheapest ever publication. Uh, it cost me almost nothing, uh, but clinically relevant, and this paper has been cited close to 100 times now. So it doesn't have to be uh, expensive to be clinically relevant. So with that, having shown the difference, we needed to study uh, dyspepsia more in Malaysians. Why was it different? Uh, and the best method of that would have been through epidemiological studies. And from an epidemiological perspective, uh, the best type of study uh, to give you information about a condition is still the population-based uh, uh, or community-based study. Why is that? One. It gives you a, a broad spectrum, but secondly and most importantly, uh, previous data, but not until then, had shown that many patients with dyspepsia don't necessarily consult medical practitioners. So if your studies were based in a hospital or uh, institution, you'd be missing out large chunks. But I'd just come back, I'd done all my clinical training, I had no idea 
how to do a population-based study. And for that, I am extremely, extremely grateful to Professor Goh, who introduced me to Professor uh, Hematram Yadav at that time. That uh, introduction uh, was to be the start of a wonderful relationship because um, uh, Professor Yadav was absolutely, absolutely instrumental in the uh, epidemiological work that was to come out from our unit. Professor Yadav also introduced me to two other important individuals who were absolutely vital to our work. Uh, one is Miss Chet Norizan Moyes, who was his PA at that time, and really a lot of the work, uh, a lot of the groundwork uh, had been conducted by her, an absolutely brilliant person. And the other person is Dr. Sanjay Rampal, uh, who was again a lecturer at uh, the SPM department, who still is uh, a member of the SPM department, an absolute whiz uh, in statistics and very, very helpful in much of the work that was going to come out later on. So through Professor Yadav, really, um, we had to design a population-based study but one of the problems of a population-based study in Malaysia is that uh, we are one country with two different uh, types of population, as most of you know. Uh, about 40% of the population are still in rural areas, and only about 50-50 plus are in the urban areas. So one study could not cover everything. It had to be two separate studies. So a lot of work, a lot of uh, organization, a lot of... Uh, uh, permission, health authority, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, had to be done, and I'm extremely grateful to Professor Yadav, who, who who really helped to guide in many, many of these uh, uh, pivotal uh, developments at that time. So, uh, out of convenience, we chose uh, two areas to represent the urban Malaysia and rural Malaysia. Urban Malaysia was within KL uh, in. Uh, demographic area that was uh, typical of the population here. And in rural area, we chose Kuala Langat. Again, uh, mostly, largely because of the UM uh, connection in this area. And a lot of work was done. Um, we had to, after getting all the official permission, etc., we had to train data collectors. You can see me here going out to um, uh, Kuala Langat training data collectors that took quite a bit of time. I had to go out in jeeps and vans to uh, to uh, inspect that the data collection was done properly. I had a couple of home visits. Never thought I'd do that my entire life. Uh, don't forget, I spent most of my time on clinics, wards, and uh, in the endoscopy unit. So going around to collect uh, data was quite an eye-opener for me. But one of the most useful experiences I ever had. And with that, we were able to collect phenomenal data, especially from a rural population. We did a similar thing, don't have any pictures, uh, of the urban population area, but that turned out to be a lot harder work uh, because nobody trusted you when you came to the gate. Uh, and usually they'd shoot at you or throw guns, uh, bot stones at you. So that took a lot harder. And of course, I couldn't take pictures like this. Or I'd be in jail by now. but. Um, Needless to say, uh, a lot of work was uh, uh, collected, a lot of data analyzed. And with that, we came out with the first true population-based prevalence study for dyspepsia in rural Malaysia. And that was about well, just under 15% at that time. And subsequently, in urban Malaysia, about 24.3%. Uh, so we were able to show for the first time that differences existed between rural and urban populations. And part of that was due to the underlying epidemiology. The epidemiology dyspepsia up to then had been predominantly based on uh, European type populations. And we were, show that we were able to show that different factors influence dyspepsia, at least in the rural setting, uh, in terms of socioeconomic and uh, education type levels. And in an urban setting, uh, we were able to show that ethnicity played an important point uh, and even uh, spicy type food. Again, a lot had been talked about, but not much had been published before. So this was all uh, first and new uh, uh, data. We then went on to look at the underlying cause of dyspepsia, again, uh, widely known, but not much in our uh, population. So this was 
a little bit more straightforward for me, uh, an endoscopy-based study of more than 1,000 patients. And we showed that uh, similar to, to some Western, but not to other uh, Asian countries, that the vast, vast majority had uh, functional disease, uh, a few had ulcers and reflux esophagitis. This data was published in an American journal, so uh, we were impressed that they were interested in our data at that time. Uh, and it largely showed again that about three quarters of our population had functional uh, disease and only a quarter had uh, uh, organic disease. What's the relevance of this? Well, um, one is that most functional dyspepsia doesn't cause mortality. So that's a good thing. You're not going to die from something. It's as common as 20% in, uh, in the population. But the bad thing is that uh, Dyspepsias, uh, just like migraine and just like some other chronic diseases, tends to persist. And natural history studies have shown that these symptoms persist. And because of that, uh, patients never feel 100% well. So we had to study the impact of dyspepsia in our uh, uh, population. We knew that they were not going, really going to die from it. H how did we do that? And from, again, uh, reading of the literature, we found out that two things were important to, uh, to study uh, in these chronic conditions. One is quality of life, and the other is the economic impact of the disease. Now, I keep saying this again and again, I'm a clinician, okay? And I had no clue what quality of life is. Uh, my average day to job is seeing patients on the wards, uh, doing endoscopy, staying back, to make sure the trainees are happy and, and that, that, that no problems have developed af after the procedures. And then I go home, and then usually my wife shouts at me because I've not done enough housework. So a good quality of life for me was to be able to combine that with a little bit less shouting. Uh, so I did not know how would you measure uh, quality of life uh, in these uh, patients. Again. Once again, I was very fortunate that uh, Professor Go managed to uh, introduce me to someone in Singapore at that time. This is a time when uh, not much quality of life work had been published in Malaysia. Since then, I'm aware now that there are many experts of quality of life in, in, in University of Malaya. But uh, this is about 2006, 2007. Uh, and this individual in Singapore General Hospital called Julian Thambu, had published, uh, had been publishing, and continues to publish quite a bit of work uh, on quality of life. He's a clinical rheumatologist, uh, not an academic professor. A clinical rheumatologist at that time, I think in 2007, he had already had about 75 publications. And um, through Professor Gore, I was introduced to this individual. And what an amazing man he was. For such a busy individual, uh, he was willing to entertain me, and uh, I'm most grateful for, for his uh, generosity, uh, for willing to entertain me. Uh, of course, I uh, offered to do some collaborative work with him, uh, but still, he was so busy, he didn't have to say yes, uh, and I'm very grateful he did. And the important thing that Julian did for me was he introduced me to his uh, postdoc student, uh, Dr. Wee Hui Lin. She's a pharmacy-based graduate now has become assistant professor in uh, uh, pharmacy in National University of Singapore. And it was with Dr. Wee that I did a lot of uh, work uh, on quality of life. I had to learn quality of life. I had to travel up and down between KL and Singapore. Of course, you couldn't expect her to come here. Uh, most of my weekends were spent uh, traveling up and down, uh, a lot of emails as well. I had to buy this book. I used to buy books on endoscopy and GI diseases. Never bought a book on quality of life. I had to read this book on quality of life. But it was much of an eye-opener. And I must say that um, all that effort paid off subsequently uh, with two publications examining uh, and validating and translating uh, two, two types of quality of life instruments which we were going to use later on in our um, work. Having done that, we applied that quality of life instruments back again to our population-based study. And we were able to show 
for the first time in an Asian cyber setting. This had been documented before in Europeans, but we were able to show in an Asian setting that dyspepsia, even though it doesn't cause death, was also resulted in an impairment of quality of life in, in um, Asian patients. I also had to do some DIY health economics. Again, I have no background in this, but had some exposure uh, when, when I was in the UK. And again, had to buy another expensive textbook. I keep buying these things. And, and with that, taught myself how to do some uh, health economics. And we came up with another publication on the economic impact of dyspepsia. You may say, so what? So what is that we are able to give you a black and white figure a black and white figure on the impact. And then when the uh, Matsale or Ang Mo writes, this is the impact of dyspepsia in our population, you can say, hang on a minute, uh, you know, it's not quite the same in our setting. And you can give your explanations to it. So it gives you local data and it puts your perspective in the international are arena. And if you don't have black and white data, I'm afraid you cannot do such a thing. So we have shown that dyspepsia had an impact. Uh, our next step was to see whether we could reduce the impact of, of dyspepsia in our, our Asians. And what we had found out from some other uh, previous work was that a lot of our dyspeptic patients with uh, ulcers, etc., were associated with H. pylori infection. And another important thing was that most patients with dyspepsia consulted at the primary care level. So if you're going to make a difference in terms of their symptoms and treatment, you had to do a primary care study. And again, I had to turn to Professor Gore, or Papa Gore, as he's known in the gastroenterology unit. Papa Gore, can you please help us? Uh, I don't know where to do this primary care study. And he said, no problem, Sanjeev, no problem. I will introduce you to Ember Chia. I said, oh. Amber Chia, you know such important persons. And he said, yes, yes, uh, Amber Chia Yok Chin from <laughs> Primary Care Unit. And uh, I was very fortunate for uh, uh, Professor Goh's introduction to uh, Professor YC Chia uh, in this glamorous looking photograph. Uh, and it was together with her and, and two other colleagues, Dr. Vino Tini, who's no longer with us now. She's in private practice. and. Dr. Mohazmi, who's still with us, uh, uh, we were able to conduct a clinical trial in, in primary care. This was a randomized study of m close to 500 patients uh, with dyspepsia, and we randomized them to one H. pylori-based treatment versus uh, endoscopy. At this time, this was the largest trial ever uh, on these two different treatments, uh, and we were able to get it published uh, in a British journal. What we showed was that uh, neither of these treatments made a big deal. It had improved their treatment, uh, their symptoms considerably, but using the H. pylori non-invasive technique caused, uh, resulted in a much cheaper method of improving patients' symptoms. So this data was accepted for publication in GUT. GUT is the British Journal of uh, Gastroenterology, at that time with an impact factor of 11. Uh, the second highest ranking journal in gastroenterology. So again, uh, totally surprising me that uh, a British journal would be interested in our Asian data, but clearly showing that uh, if you do the studies well, uh, it is still of uh, importance in the international rank. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to summarize uh, what we have found uh, from the work conducted here, that dyspepsia is a common condition the epidemiology of dyspepsia, uh, at least in the rural and urban populations, is unique, and it's different to uh, what is experienced in the West. We have found that most of it's due to benign disease, but regardless, it has an impact on your quality of life and from an economic perspective. Uh, and uh, our randomized trial showed that if you do a non-invasive H. pylori-based treatment, you are able to reduce the impact of dyspepsia in Malaysia. So I, when I did these studies, I thought that uh, most of this work would only be of relevance to our population here. 
and that it would not really be of interest to many people outside these shores. But of course, the fact that they got accepted by uh, international journals and the fact that it's been cited quite a lot has shown me that you know, uh, the work has been recognized. But there is recognition beyond that which uh, I feel that uh, has made our work very special. For one, that uh, thanks to the work here, uh, Malaysia now is represented on the dyspepsia global map. Uh, and the figure that you see for uh, Malaysia is purely from the publications uh, that from University of Malaya. And you can say, so what, I, says, I suppose. But it gives you a figure and how common uh, this condition is here compared to the rest of the world. Secondly, around this time when the papers uh, came out, uh, there was a group of experts in functional GI disease who were keen to come up with some consensus statements on uh, uh, dyspepsia in the Asian region. And they felt that the condition was clearly, like, like we did as well, different in an Asian setting compared to the West. So a consensus group uh, was formed. And to my pleasant surprise, I was invited to join this group as the only expert uh, from Malaysia. Uh, as you can see, uh, all these people are old and ugly, and then the right handsome person is here. Okay. Uh, in the front also, most of them don't have hair, uh, so I was quite pleased that I still have my hair. Anyway, serious side note, uh, this was a phenomenal experience for me uh, to, to sit on a forum like this. Uh, some of them are very senior people, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, great experts in the field, and here I was having just done a couple of studies, but clearly of, of relevance in this field and, and that is why I was invited. The consensus group came up with two uh, uh, leading publications uh, in the Asian, uh, Asia Pacific journals. Uh, and uh, this, again, has been heavily quoted uh, for many, many subsequent uh, clinical research and trials. So that was another important recognition of my work. The third came from this man called uh, Nicholas Telly. Uh, whom some of you may know as uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Newcastle in Australia. He's also the author of this best-selling uh, undergraduate textbook, uh, Clinical Examination, currently in its sixth edition. But what some of you may not know is that Professor Telly is also an eminent uh, gastroenterologist uh, who is an expert in the field of uh, functional uh, dyspepsia, functional GI disease, has more than 600 publications to his name, and clearly a, a dominant figure in this field. And he's also uh, uh, come up with a book called GI Epidemiology. In its first edition several years ago, uh, it was criticized that it didn't have that much of a global perspective, and most of the authors were uh, mostly uh, from the West. So they wanted to invite a variety of authors to contribute uh, to this second edition. And again, to my pleasant surprise and to my deep uh, uh, greatest honor, uh, they invited me and, and Professor Yadav to talk about, of all things, population-based studies. <laughs> but from a GI point of view, and, and really, uh, this was phenomenal. Phenomenal for me to be associated with this work uh, and also to be recognized. And even more, when. Towards the end, I didn't know who they had invited to join this. Is uh, when I looked at the list of contributors when the when the book came out. So you say USA, 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 Calgary, USA, USA, Canada, USA, 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 Sweden, then Malaysia, Bole. Yeah. <laughs> so of course, um, uh, Professor Yadav's name was also subsequently down on the list, uh, but he didn't have Bole next to it. Yeah. Uh, so quite. Uh, quite an important uh, recognition for me. Lastly, uh, comes from uh, this organization known as the United European Gastroenterology uh, Organization. The United European Gastroenterology is like the uh, European Union. It's a amalgamation of all the national societies in Europe. And together, they're very, very powerful, very organized uh, unit. They have an annual scientific conference, which is attended by some 15,000 to 20,000 delegates, huge. In that conference, 
they run an evidence-based medicine course, which is a small group, and uh, uh, it's focused on teaching evidence-based medicine from the GI point of view to uh, clinical trainees and fellows in Europe. Now, in 2013, which was last year, one of the faculty, which was a GI epidemiologist from Nottingham, said he was fed up of doing this course because he was only paid 3,000 euro dollars, in addition to business class flight and hotel as well. So he wanted more money than that. And the organizers said, uh, sorry, we can't pay you more than 3,000 euro dollars for doing this two-day course. So at the last minute, they were stuck. And they needed someone cheap. And they needed someone competent. So cheap and competent came in the form of another Malaysia bully. So um, in the 2013 uh, European uh, UEG education course, uh, again, uh, the faculty consisted of all Europeans and one Malaysian uh, bully, uh, doctor. And to me, uh, when I asked them why they, they invited me, they said, again, it's purely because of the work that we had done. This was a very, very exciting uh, experience for me. It was sort of a slow, uh, close group uh, uh, education forum, but you had a chance to meet trainees from Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Brit Britain, etc. And what was even more uh, pleasant was when people came up to you and said, oh, you are that Mahadeva guy. I have read your work. I have never attended a Malaysian meeting where people say that. Uh, <laughs> I have never attended an Asian meeting where people say that. So uh, it was most impressive uh, when these trainees, you know, these are trainees, they are not uh, academics. These are trainees who came up to me. And never, needless to say, I had a wonderful time and, and truly uh, phenomenal recognition for work that was done here. Ladies and gentlemen, I've shown you a, a breeze through the work we've done uh, and some of the recognition, but none of it could have happened without uh, uh, the help of so many people. And, and as they say, no man is an island. I'd like to reiterate again my uh, appreciation to my mentor and supporter, Professor uh, K.L. Goh, who, as you can see, um, if not for his introduction to, to people like Professor Yadav, uh, Amber Chia, and many other prominent people, uh, I don't think I would have achieved uh, uh, what we could have achieved so far. The next per person I think uh, was, is really the bedrock of most of my research, in fact all of my research, uh, is uh, Mrs. Manjit who is my research assistant. Um, I'm very fortunate that Mrs. Manjit is still here uh, because really I was very worried that we would lose her uh, because two of her daughters have migrated to Australia. And every year I keep asking, are you going, are you going, are you going? Uh, and I'm very, very, very lucky that she's decided to stay on. Uh, luckily, her husband is still alive, so there's a reason to stay on. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, the reason that Mrs. Manjit is so special, uh, and, and many of you may not understand this, is that when she, f she was first introduced to me by Dr. Vino Tini back in 2003 and Professor Chia. And um, we didn't have much money then. We did not have much money. And you may find it unbelievable now, but we paid her 500 ringgit a month to do all that research, a lot of that research that you've seen here uh, that has been published today. And I thought she was going to walk, man. I thought she was going to walk. And she said, forget it, 500, no way. You know, I can earn more in uh, Chakwetia stall or something like that. Uh, sorry, Punjabi uh, Chapati stall. Um, but she didn't. And 10 years later, 11 years later, I am so, so grateful because uh, it is through her uh, that meant much of the research has happened. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is Mrs. Manjit has this ability to ensure that patients come for their follow-up. I don't know what she does. I don't care how she does it but she does a fantastic job. And I really uh, would like to uh, uh, sh uh, express my greatest gratitude to her for all the work that she has done. Uh, next uh, are all my clinical colleagues uh, in gastroenterology. As you can see, they love posing for photographs. 
Uh, some of them don't have time because they spend a lot of time doing endoscopy, so I've had to superimpose their photos. Um, but uh, to all the uh, uh, doctors and nurses in gastroenterology, uh, it is because of you that I've uh, had the support to do a lot of the uh, uh, non-clinical and research work uh, that has come out from the unit. But I hope that many of you have also benefited from this. This is the current crowd. There are some old faces as well. Uh, some of them have left for private practice, and some of them, are like Professor Salim Omar, has unfortunately um, departed from this world. But I will always remember that uh, it was also their kindness and support that allowed me to pursue a lot of my uh, academic interests in, in the earlier years of uh, being in the gastro unit. Uh, None of the research is also possible without the clinical staff at UMMC, and I've shown you some pictures of uh, nurses on the ward. Uh, I don't have pictures in the clinic, I'm sorry, but all of them have been extremely helpful, uh, and uh, nurses in the endoscopy unit as well. I've also showed them before, and they've been an amazing uh, group of uh, nurses. It, it, it takes people who are tolerant, because like, for example, as you understand, we have to do uh, questionnaires, we have to ask questions. Sometimes it can uh, interfere with the day-to-day -day running of clinical services. Uh, and for that, I am extremely grateful uh, that they have been patient and tolerant. Uh, uh, next is the backbone of the Department of Medicine. Uh, Puan Rohana, uh, Puan Izzy, uh, uh, Ms. Tulisi, Puan Zura. Have I missed out anyone else? No? Huh? Oh, someone there, yeah. Okay, okay, yes, yes. Uh, one Ida as well. Uh, all of these girls have, they've, some people have come and gone. Um, they've been extremely supportive, especially with a lot of the uh, administrative work uh, which comes with uh, doing teaching and research as well. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to the greater gastroenterology unit, uh, mainly from uh, the radiology team and uh, general surgery. Uh, the size of the photos, no reflection to their contribution. Uh, <laughs> um, but some have bigger personalities than others. Yeah. And, and, and these clinical colleagues have really been uh, very helpful uh, in our day-to-day -day work and even in some of the uh, research projects that we've done. Last but not least is what we define as the study samples. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think in our, our rush for the paper chase and to get this uh, high impact factor journals, etc., it's quite easy, especially in clinical research, to forget that the research samples come from uh, patients uh, and, and, and people that we deal with in a day-to-day -day life. And, and at the end of the day, they are human beings just like you and me, and it is not right to treat them just as uh, study samples. I've just used this word in a provocative manner. Uh, they are not samples, they are human beings, and uh, if not for them, none of our research could have been conducted. And until today, I am still, still amazed at, you know, because I put myself in their position and you say, oh, I want to do an extra procedure on you. I want to take more time, more of your time. And sometimes I think if I was in theirs, I'd say, no, forget it, get lost. Uh, and these people still do uh, and participate in a lot of our studies. And, and I am eternally grateful. Ah, Lastly, um, just a few more slides. Bear with me. I know you're rushing to beat the traffic jam. I want to acknowledge some uh, skeptics who have um, made me to persevere even further. Now, uh, I don't know if many of you know, but uh, I'm the sort of person, always been, that uh, if you say I can't do it, then I try even harder to do it. Uh, and uh, which is why probably I have done many things that many of my colleagues have not done until now. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few of them. Skeptic number one uh, is this guy on the right-hand side. He was my senior colleague in Leeds. Uh, his name is Bjorn Rembecken. Uh, he is a Swedish doctor, but uh, based in the UK. And he told me, I remember this so distinctly, this is more than 11, 12 years now. 
He said, you will regret going back to Malaysia. After the second or third power cut, you will bring back your sorry backside all the way to UK. And I said, uh, hang on, uh, Bjorn, his name is Bjorn. I think you've got my country mixed up with maybe Bangladesh or Pakistan. So in prompt arrogance, I, I told him that he got it wrong, you see. Uh, so I came back to Malaysia, and I remember, uh, I think it was second or third month, uh, I was involved in the undergraduate medical exams. And at that time, Professor Adiba, the young associate Professor Adiba, was the exam coordinator. And true enough, these words came ringing back when we had a power cut. And she was going on with the lo ching ting ning ning ting ning ning uh, time over, time over, ting ning ning from door to door. And I was thinking, ayo, uh, <laughs> bastard. Okay, he was right. <laughs> but fortunately, uh, that didn't happen, pardon my French, uh, too often. And, and I'm really fortunate uh, that really uh, our standard of uh, practice is, is, is so much higher. Nowadays, I meet Bjorn at international meetings, and I actually have the opportunity to review some of his papers who are submitted to journals. So I'd love to wipe that smug off his face, uh, but I don't tell it to him, of course. Skeptic number two, our very own Dean. Uh, about one year after I came back, this was the time when uh, my ex-colleague had left. Uh, I think you remember him, Dr. Ranjiv. And so, because, of course, I think, I think both of us were fairly good looking, we dressed well and stuff. So one guy leaves automatically, you know, this racial stereotyping business. Uh, I met her in the corridor and she said, so, you're also leaving a private practice. And I was most insulted, most, most insulted. Yeah, I had all these burning ambitions for, uh, you know, doing research and things like that. And I wondered why is it that she asked me, you know, why didn't she ask someone like, I don't know, Professor Vignes Warren, for example. <laughs> no hair and a lot more fat. Uh, you know, um, uh, why, why didn't you ask uh, other people? You know, why did she pick on me? So I only deduced that just because I dressed well, uh, uh, and then and, and, uh, she chose me for that. I mean, to me, that statement was like, you know, somebody who's, uh, who had trained as a chef you know, all these fancy hotels in you know, overseas. And then you come and ask him, so uh, when are you opening your Chakwetiao stall? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> My next and last skeptics are Malaysians from abroad. And, and uh, I, this skepticism goes on until today. And I'm sure some of you have also experienced it, uh, those who have come abroad. I've put two particular countries here. Uh, because those are the only two I have to suffer, my God. Uh, but until now, um, I have get the constant jaunt that, uh, oh, you have gone back, worked in UMM, University Mickey Mouse, Malaysia. Uh, every Ali, Achong, Ramasamy is professor, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Ladies and gentlemen, while there is obviously some truth to some of the statements, but I think they're wrong. They're wrong in being very negative uh, about the work that we do here, and certainly my own experience uh, has been um, uh, that, that they have, they're completely biased uh, in their views. Singapore, of course, uh, are all full of rejected Malaysians, so uh, <laughs> I don't really take them very seriously. Yeah. But one way of shutting up these critiques, uh, one of them is actually uh, the son of a famous uh, anaesthetist, some of you may know. Uh, he's a gastroenterologist in Birmingham. His father uh, is an anaesthetist who writes for, uh, in the MMA magazine, uh, SP Scorner, I don't know, no anaesthetist here. Anyway, so this son, uh, again, he's a gastroenterologist in Birmingham, he used to taunt me and say, oh, professor, uh, professor. Uh. Um, but after I came up with that first paper in a British journal, uh, the taunting got less. And then the second paper, and then the third paper. Now he doesn't say hello to me anymore. Um, so I think the only way to keep criticism down is to show your mettle and your worth, uh, and not to take too much on board. But having said that, I do think that uh, we should maintain standards.
So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for staying back. I won't hold you much back much lo longer. I'd like to end with this. Uh, this was a great movie. Uh, Sepet, to me, this is the best local production uh, that has ever come out uh, from, from our region. And as all you know, uh, it is a low-budget film. But it had a phenomenal impact. It won awards all over the world. All over the world. And, and it was a great movie. But the point is that uh, it didn't require a lot of money to make this movie. And similarly, uh, I'd like to highlight that four of these very important papers uh, that came out from our work came out with, guess how much? Anybody want to guess what was our research grant at that time? For this time? I'll tell you that. Okay, that's all we got uh, at that time. Uh, Professor Yaraf will remember this very clearly. But I think if you have the interest and you have the determination, uh, clinical-based research can still be of a very high impact. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested enough, I think the University of Malaya is a great place to be a clinician with a research interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanjeev, and I'm sure all of you would agree with me that was a very inspiring and great Sharaham Pradhana, as it's supposed to be. So join me in clapping him and thanking him once again. Now, I'm, I'm glad I, I didn't take much of the findings of your study, Sanjeev, but I think uh, there were three big lessons to be learned from there that, um, that, that I'm glad you, you shared with us, the three common myths that you hear around the faculty. Number one, that's impossible for busy clinicians to participate in research. You very nicely debunked that myth. Number two, that it needs a lot of money to do research. Of course, it's nice to have money and do fancy GWAS studies, but uh, you were able to show that with 40,000 ringgit, how did you not pay your, your samples? Aha, that's the trick. <laughs> and number three, um, that local research is not of interest to major international journals. So I think Professor Sanjeev has very successfully uh, shared with us that all those um, are not true and that it's possible to do great research with big impact uh, locally and internationally if you are a good clinician and uh, carefully observe your patients and, and uh, tie that in with a, a, with a research question. That teamwork, teamwork is of course the important um, ingredient in successful research. Hard work and genuine interest and passion that clearly came through in his presentation. And finally, having great mentors, none other, of course, than um, Datuk, Datuk K.L. Go, he's sitting um, in the room here. So the faculty has always uh, viewed the Sharaham Pradhanas, um, taken it very seriously, and, and uh, it is my aim that it not only um, is a platform for our clinicians and researchers and, and others, members of the uh, faculty, to share their, their work. But also, the major aim is to inspire. And I'm very, very pleased to see so many medical students in this room today that I hope Professor Sanjeev has inspired you, made you realize that you're in a great faculty, um, despite what your colleagues in I'm you or Singapore or wherever they are might be saying to you. I think what, what these Sharaham Pradhanas also have managed to do, and those of you who've been coming to the last few um, have shown that in every department in, in the faculty, we have, we have world-class uh, uh, leaders and researchers and clinicians and uh, who are here to, to mold all of you, all of us, um, to, to what you all want to become. Um, I know that you know, having your, your first, when you have your first publication, what a buzz it is, and, and when you're invited to be in all these um, uh, major uh, 
panels or whatever, sitting with those those bald men with uh, <laughs> uh, um, expanding waistline. What what a thrill it is, uh, you know, to for you to represent for us all to represent the country. But as I said, it takes a lot of hard work, takes a lot of passion, and uh, importantly, also takes a lot of teamwork and perhaps uh, a bit of luck with finding the right mentors. So with that, um, thank you once again, Sanjeev, for this uh, fantastic Shaham Pradhana. <laughs> and please join all of us uh, for an afternoon tea just outside. I'm sorry that uh, with Malaysian, yeah, uh, uh, construction work that the uh, synapse where we normally have uh, the refreshments after Sharon Pradana has exploded, the tiles have exploded. But certain things we do well, but certain things uh, still remain third world. So with that, Sanjeev, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dr. Adiba, for chairing this lecture. Thank you to the management of the Faculty of Medicine, citizens of University of Malaya, as well as all the guests here for your time. With this, we have reached the end of the lecture. On behalf of the University of Malaya, I would like to apologise if there had been any weaknesses from our side in organising this lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you and have a pleasant evening. Malaysia Boleh. <laughs>